Hello, and welcome to the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program Technical Assistance Webinar for fiscal year 2024. I'm Dr. Pamela Mayman, and I'm the Senior Program Officer for the DDRA and FRA programs. And with me today is Amy Marion, and she will introduce herself. Amy? Hi, everyone. Uh, as Pamela said, my name is Amy Mary, and I'm a program officer here with the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad, or DDRA, program. This is my third year uh, working on the DDRA, so I'm looking forward to telling you more about this year's competition. So with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. We're actually both going to turn our cameras off for now. We will probably pop back on at the end, but for the duration of the slideshow, we'd like you to focus on the content. So we'll see you later. Um, and here we go. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so first up are the objectives for today's webinar. We will begin with an overview of the DDRA program. We understand that some of you are probably very familiar with the program. Others, maybe you haven't heard of it before and you're just learning more. So we'll provide all of those details for you to know more about the DDRA. We'll also go over the pre-award process, so looking at the application process, what you need to submit, who's eligible for the award, what do you receive as a DDRA fellow. We'll also provide an overview um, of the application review process and definitely pay really close attention to this because you want to be keeping all of this in mind throughout your application and making sure that you are hitting all of the really important parts of the application, which you will be assessed on. And building on that, we will also provide you with some application tips on how to submit the strongest application possible. And we will also provide um, some links to additional information and information on upcoming question and answer sessions, that which will be live. And in addition to that, I did want to point out that on the DDRA website under application information, there is a Word document, which is our application instructions, and this is updated every year. It is a long document. It's about, I think, 150 pages, and don't worry, you don't have to read everything in it, but it is a really great guide to the application process. So we highly recommend that you review this and download it now or after the webinar, and this will be posted on YouTube, so you can get a direct link to the application information website with the link to the Word document in the description of this video. So we wanted to point that out as an additional resource. OK, so before we go into the DDRA, we wanted to provide a really brief history of the Fulbright programs and the International and Foreign Language Education Office, also known as IFL, here at the U.S. Department of Education. The Fulbright Hayes programs are all run by the U.S. Department of Education and the IFL office. There are four programs. So we have the DDRA, which we'll talk a lot about today. We also have the Faculty Research Abroad, or the FRA, the Group Projects Abroad, or GPA, and Seminars Abroad. So those are all of the Fulbright Hayes programs that are under the U.S. Department of Education. And more about Fulbright Hayes. So the Fulbright Hayes Act of 1961 is officially known as the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act of 1961. It was marshaled by the United States Senator J. William Fulbright and enacted by the 87th United States Congress on September 21st, 1961, so over 60 years ago. The international education programs, including the Peace Corps, were originally created under the National Defense Education Act and then incorporated into the Higher Education Act. Section 102B6 of the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act, or Fulbright-Hayes, created an overseas component to the otherwise domestically based international education programs under Title VI. To date, we've had over 6,000 fellows funded by Fulbright-Hayes DDRA. And all final approval of award recommendations are reviewed by the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, or the FFSB. That's just a really brief little history lesson on the Fulbright Hayes. So we're just gonna keep on moving. Okay, the DDRA. The Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad is designed to contribute to the development and improvement of the study of modern foreign languages and area studies in the United States by providing opportunities for scholars to conduct research abroad. So for the purpose of this program, area studies is defined as an interdisciplinary program of comprehensive study of the aspects of a society or societies, including the study of their geography, history, culture, 
economy, politics, education, international relations, and language. Since area studies is very broadly defined in our definition, um, we've had students from many different disciplines apply to the DDRA every year. So keep that in mind. Um, there are a lot of possibilities for applicants to the DDRA. So DDRA is an annual competition, and that uh, means that typically we have a competition every year. And how it works is the eligible applicant is institution of higher education. So I'm sure we have a lot of uh, what we call project directors listening to this uh, webinar, and those are the folks at universities across the U.S. who are helping organize applications. And who's eligible to receive a fellowship would be a U.S. citizen or national permanent resident, a graduate student in good standing at a U.S. institution of higher education who is enrolled in a Ph.D. program, as this is a program for doctoral research. The institutional project period, so the entire time from receiving the funds at the institution to give to the fellow who's been awarded a fellowship is 18 months. And the research period has a minimum of six months up to 12 months. So anyone who's listening today, you can submit a project that has that is up to 12 months long or as short as six months. Uh, it cannot be shorter than six. It cannot be longer than 12. And the duration of the research that you're proposing has no impact on the strength of your application. So if it needs to be six months because that's what you need, then great. If it needs to be 12 months, then you should be applying for 12 months. The most important thing is submitting a strong application to support why you'd like a six month fellowship or an eight month fellowship or a 12 month fellowship or anything in between. So keep that in mind. Um, and also this is a consecutive award. So when you receive an award, let's say it is six months, you must complete those six months abroad straight through. Um, there's no break in between for a month or two or anything like that. There could be an exception for an unexpected emergency, um, but nothing pre-planned. And all applications for the DDRA will be submitted through the Department of Education's G5 e application system. And G5 is currently going through some updates. So there are instances where you might see it referred to as G6, or the home landing page might say G6, and then you log in and it says G5. Just letting you all know that that is okay and normal, and um, you will probably mostly be looking at G5, but if you see G6, that's fine. Everything is still connected, so um, hopefully we can avoid any uh, major confusion there. Okay, so a little bit of information regarding travel. Uh, this fellowship does provide travel. So dates. First up, the DDRA travel period for this competition will be January 1st, 2025 to December 31st, 2025. Travel will only be permitted under a grant activation request or a GAR. You'll learn more about that later. But the most important thing for you as an applicant is keeping in mind that this award period is for January 1st, 2025, December 31st, 2025. So if your research seems like will be happening in 2025, this is great. If you're thinking it's more like 2027, um, this might not be the year for you to apply. GARs uh, or these travel requests will not be approved um, if a country is not open to fellows. So if you have any concerns about the country or countries that you're hoping to conduct research in, I do recommend referring to the application instructions that I previously mentioned. Um, there are some notes about countries that are open or closed to Fulbright Fellows, and also definitely use your project director as a resource. That is the individual on your campus who is helping collect all of the applications and submitting them on behalf of any applicants at your institution. Without the project director, uh, you will not be able to apply. So if there's anyone listening today that is at a campus that doesn't have a project director, you can definitely contact us and we will work with you and your institution to make sure that that is set up as soon as possible. The next one, again, no travel will be permitted before January 1st. So if you're hoping to go in December 2024, uh, you cannot do that. So just keep that in mind and make sure that your proposal and your application is for anywhere between January 1st and December 31st of next year. Research periods, again, may not be less than six months and not more than 12 months, and they must be consecutive. And there are no deferrals. So again, please consider your timeline and the places that you need to be going and uh, your current research status at knowing that if you do apply for this, you cannot defer it for a year or two years. You must uh, go during the designated travel period. 
Okay, these are just a couple of resources that uh, you would probably be using as a fellow, and you might want to be utilizing these resources just to see what's going on in the countries that you might be considering conducting research. So some of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with these, the Smart Travel or Enrollment Program, or STEP through the U.S. Department of State. Any DDRA fellow who successfully completes the application and becomes a fellow will have to register through the STEP program throughout the, their fellowship. The second link uh, is country information, which is provided by the U.S. Department of State. So again, this is a really great resource to be utilizing to see what's going on where you are hoping to conduct research. The next link is similar. It's also travel advisory. So in addition to the overview of the countries, these are more emergent things that might be happening where you're considering travel. The last one, CDC information. So we always recommend folks um, before they travel to check in with their primary care physician and be updated on any immunizations or preparing for any me medications that you might need while traveling. So we will, you know, go through all of this when we do our new fellow orientation. Um, but this is all really important to keep in mind uh, as you are kind of planning out your your next steps. And this is also still COVID obviously is much less prevalent and less disruptive as it once was. But these slides are also this slide is also related to COVID because that did have a very large impact on the program for a couple of years. So things could always change. Hopefully they don't. But um, I think a lot of these links actually relate to the current COVID situation overseas as well. So anyway, more to come on this, um, but hopefully these are helpful resources for anyone who's just doing more general background research. All right, so every year uh, the DDRA has competition priorities, and these are the ones for this year, 2024. So the first is the absolute priority. So this means that any of the applications that we receive must meet the absolute priority, which is geographic area. So the priority is a research project that focuses on one or more of the following geographic areas, Africa, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands, South Asia, the Near East, Central and Eastern Europe, and Eurasia, and the Western Hemisphere, excluding the United States and its territories. So your topic must be focused outside of Western Europe. It cannot be a solely uh, solely focused on some sort of topic in Western Europe. So for example, we would not typically have an applicant for research solely in Germany or, you know, like a six, if you proposed a project for six months in Germany, that would probably not be an allowable project. However, if you had some part of your project focused on reviewing the archives in Germany for a topic that actually has a focus in Argentina or India or some other region, which is allowable under our absolute priority for geographic area, that would be allowable. Um, so maybe you're going to Germany for two months and then you're going to Argentina for six months for an eight month fellowship. But a proposal for six months in England or six months in Germany or eight months in France, uh, those typically would not be allowable because your academic focus should be um, on a topic outside of Western Europe or have a component which is not solely focused on Western Europe. We're happy to speak to anyone um, to review what your topic is and make sure that it is eligible, but keep the regional uh, or the geographic areas in mind when you are considering your application and your research. And then this year we have three competitive preference priorities. For those of you who are familiar with this competition, these are the same competitive preference priorities as the last uh, couple of years. So the first one is a focus on less commonly taught languages. So those would be any languages besides French, German, or Spanish. The second is a thematic focus on academic. Oh, and the less common, as you can see on the screen, the less commonly taught languages, uh, you would receive two additional points. The second competitive preference priority is a thematic focus on academic fields for two points, and um, these uh, it would be a research project conducted in the field of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, computer science, education, uh, comparative or international education, international development, political science, public health or economics. The last competitive preference priority um, is promoting equity and student access to educational resources and opportunities. So this is based on the type of institution that you are applying from. 
So projects that are implemented by any of the following entities, historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs, uh, minority serving institutions or MSIs and tribal colleges and universities. So this would be the first two are um, individual based on your research itself. And the third competitive preference priority is based on the school that you are currently enrolled on and enrolled in and their status um, as an HBCU or an MSI. So that's something that um, you would you would denote that on your application and then we would confirm and you would also receive two points if you fall under those designations. All right, so updates for this year's funds and awards. So this year, the estimated available funds are $3,277,596. The estimated range of awards will be approximately $15,000 to $60,000. So each fellow might receive anywhere within that range based on your needs and your project. The estimated average size of awards is $36,418, and we are estimating a number of about 90 DDRA fellowships for fiscal year 2024, um, but please note that we are not bound by any estimates in this notice. Okay, so eligibility for grant funding. So only institutions of higher education are eligible to apply. I briefly mentioned this earlier. So that means, again, you must have a project director or your institution that is kind of overseeing the application process for your entire institution. So each institutional applicant must appoint all well, this kind of builds off what I just said. So yeah, each institutional applicant must appoint a DRI project director, and this project director assumes the responsibility to first of all, register as a project director for their university in the G5 application system. Uh, Pamela and myself can help with that. So you can email DDRA at ed.gov, which is also in the description of this video to talk more about getting registered as a project director. Um, project directors are also required to advise and guide individual student applications. So that might mean meeting with a student to discuss their intent to submit an application and then providing any support, asking questions, being the main point of contact between your institution and our office. So typically uh, project directors are the ones that are emailing Pamela and myself to ask questions, um, inquire, for example, about the geographic regions for the DDRA. Maybe there's a little bit of a tricky question there. So uh, the project director should work with the student and then reach out to Pamela and myself at DDRA at ed.gov to ask that question. Um, that's really helpful because we do have many, many, many applicants. And so having the project director on your campus um, helps streamline communication and also um, helps everyone kind of stay on the same page. So the project director also must submit the entire application to the U.S. Department of Education. They also must administer the grant and disperse funds if awarded the, the grant. So, um, for example, you, a project director might submit four applicants to the DDRA. Maybe only two are successful. Those two successful awards would then be administered by the project director and any other individuals on your campus that um, support grants um, and dispersing funds. So the money is going to go to the institution and then the institution will disperse it to the fellows. So I know some other fellowships might work a little bit differently or perhaps the fellow receives the funding directly to their bank account, for example. Um, that will not happen from the Department of Education, but that will happen in some way, depending on what, whoever your institution is and how they work the process. The institution will figure out how the money will end up with the fellow for their uh, grant period. Lastly, the project director will serve as the point of contact for all the institution fellows, regardless of research topic or discipline. So I already went through that again. Project director is the main point of contact between the Department of Ed and any fellows. So eligibility for the DDRI fellowship. So all DDRI applicants must be a citizen or national of the United States or a permanent resident. They must be a graduate student in good standing at an eligible institution of higher education, so a U.S.-based institution. And when the fellowship period begins, is admitted to candidacy in a doctoral degree program in modern foreign languages and area studies at that institution. 
eligible applicants should have plans of a teaching career in the United States upon graduation or who plan to apply language skills in world areas vital to U.S. national security and knowledge of these countries in fields of government, international development, and various professions. And applicants should also possess adequate skills in foreign languages necessary to carry out the dissertation project. And also, a small note here, we mentioned that you must be a citizen or a national of the United States or a permanent resident. Uh, the DDRA is not eligible for J-1 visa holders. So Fulbright-Hayes DDRA and the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. So I'm sure some of you on this call are perhaps Fulbright uh, alumni or you are maybe also applying to the Fulbright Student Program. As an administrative note, um, the Fulbright Student Program is administered by the Institute of International Education. That is the nonprofit that works with the U.S. Department of State to manage that program. So as stated by the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, no applicant may receive concurrently a grant from the Fulbright Student Program and a grant from the Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program. So this is important because I'm sure some folks on the call might be submitting an application to both DDRA and the Fulbright Student Program. That is allowed. However, you cannot receive this, both of those awards in the same year. So if you receive the Fulbright Student Award and you accept that award, you cannot accept the DDRA and vice versa. So um, an applicant to the DRA program must indicate on their application to the program if they have applied for the Fulbright Student Program. Once a candidate has accepted an award, as I've already mentioned, and the student program has expended funds on the student, then they are not eligible for a DDRA award. If at any point the candidate accepts the student award, Prior to being notified by of their status by the DDRA program, the candidate must notify our office immediately. And additionally, if after consultation with the Fulbright Student Program, we determine that a Fulbright student has the Fulbright program has already expended funds on that student. Um, for example, maybe you attended the pre-departure orientation or were issued grant funds to purchase travel tickets or something like that, then uh, you would be ineligible for the award at that time. So I would just recommend anyone who's applying for both to be really careful and to um, communicate with your project director, communicate with us, communicate with um, the student program uh, before making any final decisions and just, you know, let us know what is happening. Um, I will say that oftentimes the timeline for hearing from either of the awards um, can vary. So sometimes you might have to make a decision without knowing if you received one or the other award based on the timeline for your research. So that's really personal to you and your research plans, but I'm just putting that out there so nobody is completely surprised. And, you know, we don't know when the awards will be awarded yet because it's a multifaceted, uh, many month process with a lot of people involved, but we will try our best to let applicants know if, or as soon as we are able. Okay, as we've noted many times, the project director is that main point of contact uh, for the DDRA. And so these are the different materials that the project director must review for the student's application to be submitted through the G5 system. So first of all, the Fulbright Hayes DDRA application form, the CV, the project description, application narrative, which must comply with the guidelines, which we'll talk more about, the application bibliography, uh, one foreign language reference, three graduate student reference forms, transcripts, letters of affiliation from the host country and supporting materials, and institutional review board or IRB narrative if applicable. So these are the main components of the application um, based on your research and needs and um, you know your personal situation, your application um, might have, you know, different aspects from other folks, but basically the project director, you know, the most important thing is making sure that all of your applicants are submitting a complete application because once the deadline is passed, we cannot accept any uh, additional materials. And without having, you know, your CV, for example, that's an entire section of the criteria uh, where you will receive zero points, which would be very detrimental to your application, even if it's a strong application. So project directors are play a very big part in this. So this is hopefully just a little checklist of what to be looking for. 
And again, there are those application instructions, which also uh, provide a ton of information, which is helpful when you're um, serving as the project director role. Speaking of which, so this next slide is just a, a quick visual for the roles and responsibilities um, for the institution, the fellows, and the references. So the institution, um, should be attending uh, the technical assistance webinar, which is what we're doing right now. We'll also be having a live version of this. Um, the institution needs to appoint a project director, which registers in G5. Again, we can help with that. If you need a person appointed, let us know. Uh, the institution makes fellowship application materials available to students. They also accept and screen applications in accordance to its own technical and academic criteria. Um, the institution includes student applications with institutional um, it includes student applications with the institutional application. So the project director will be uh, compiling a couple of documents that are based on the institutional background. And then in addition to that part of the application, they will also be including the student application, which we were just speaking about a moment ago with the various components that we want to make sure are not missing uh, when you submit it. And then the institution is also responsible for administering the grant and dispersing funds. So again, I just I've already said this, but just to reiterate, the funds will go directly to the institution for any successful applicants. And then the institution um, will work with the Department of Education to make sure, for example, travel is approved. Once travel is approved, the institution will do their own thing to get the money to the student. So. Uh, once the money is with the institution, starts following your institution's guidelines for dispersing funds to students. And, we, you know, we'll talk more about that once we get past the application process, but just to um, set that expectation uh, now. So next up, the fellows. So fellows should contact the project director for institutional information uh, for submitting the application. Fellows will have to register in G5 which again is the application system. You'll need to initiate emails to solicit references. We highly recommend doing this as soon as possible. You'll need to submit and complete your application in G5 before the deadline, um, well before the deadline, I would say, just in case. Submit uh, institutional or IRB narrative to the project director to upload to G5 and uh, follow up with your project director to make sure they've had a chance to review your application, you're not missing anything, if they have any questions. Uh, and make sure you're doing this far in advance. Um, the application is due March 29th, 2024. So we've got, you know, a little over a month now, which is great, but make sure you're doing all these things as soon as possible. For references, uh, the references will receive reference forms from the fellow to complete. Make sure you give them a deadline. They will complete and submit the reference form and send the project director a copy of the reference and the form, and this will be uploaded to the application. So hopefully this helps lay out a little bit more the roles of the different all the different players in the application process for the DDRA. Okay, so now we're going to get just a little more technical, but not too much. Um, so again, G5 is our EA application system. Don't be worried if you see it referred to as G6. They're basically the same at the moment. Um, so you'll submit your individual application to the project director using G5. Uh, language and academic references will submit forms to the project director using G5. And this, we do recommend that references are located in the United States simply because G5 is based in the United States and is a US government system. I've heard mixed things of people being able to submit them overseas. There are no guarantees there, but we just have that there just in case. So keep that in mind. If you do have an overseas reference, they could run into issues submitting in G5. So again, just following that, like do things as soon as possible in case you have a, you need to resort to a backup plan there. These are pretty technical notes here. So unfortunately our system G5 currently does not um, approve any special or somewhat common symbols, as you can see. So foreign characters, as well as something like a percentage sign or an asterisk or any of those, they're not accepted. Um, and I apologize for this. I know it's a little frustrating, especially for um, an international program. But with that, please try your best to not use any of these symbols um, in your application. And the reason for that is when we review your application, it will um, 
distort some of what is written when we have those special characters uh, submitted. So um, yeah, they try your best to not include those if at all possible. And lastly, please remove any personally identifiable information from transcripts, including your birth date, your social security number, and your home address. Um, we don't want to see any of that information. We don't need that information. And as I uh, alluded to earlier, the review process is multifaceted and there are a lot of parties involved and applications are reviewed by um, overseas posts and um, things like that. And they are sent securely. However, we don't want to or we can't send anything with your birth date or your social security number, or your student ID number. So please, please be sure when you are um, submitting your application that you get all of that redacted. Uh, you could print it out and black it out or you can use software. Um, we really don't want to see any of that. So please um, try your best to remove any of that prior to submitting your application. OK, so continuing with our little technical overview here with G5. So when you get started, um, fellows must select no to the question, are you registering as a Fulbright or as a fellowship Fulbright Hayes doctoral dissertation or research or faculty abroad director? Please say no because you are not the project director. And fellows, please instruct the referee to print and send a copy of the reference letter and form to the project director. DDRA reference forms, fellowship applicants need to at least save a draft of the DDRA form with their name, institution, country of research and language. After that, the reference form will appear and project directors must register as applicant and not project director in their G5 file. I know this is a little confusing, but please feel free to reference back to this when you're going through the process if you have not already. And the project director will officially submit the Institute of Higher Education and all eligible individual student applications, reference forms, IRB narratives, and other required forms using G5. So if you are not already in G5, again, get in contact with us so we can help you get registered. We also have um, some project directors who have been doing this for many years, and they also know all the ins and outs of G5. So we're happy to facilitate those connections if you would um, like some additional support as you're figuring this out so we can try our best to make sure all applications are submitted completely and on time. And lastly, make sure that all applicants and referees hit submit to complete the application submission. I know that might seem obvious, but sometimes you just need to double check. So make sure it has been submitted. All right. So for eligibility screening, um, we will be reviewing all applicants to make sure that they are eligible. So we screen all applicants for technical eligibility in accordance with the evaluation criteria published in the notice inviting applications and the program specific regulations 34 CFR part 662. So all of the criteria that you will be scored on is in the notice inviting applications and the application instructions. So when you are crafting your application, please be sure to reference that because it's everything you need to know and it's everything that you can, you know, cross check to make sure in your application you've addressed all of the necessary areas completely and you know that you can get as many points as possible in those sections. If you miss something completely, you will get zero points. So keep that in mind. So as far as eligibility, U.S. institution eligibility, you have to register project director. We talked about that. Let's make sure you register. Let us know. And you also have to have a registered unique entity ID, which was formerly the DUN number, but now it is the UEI and a taxpayer identification number or a TIN. Um, for student eligibility, we've reviewed this, but once again, U.S. citizenship, you must be in good academic standing plant with plans of a career in teaching or world areas vital to U.S. national security. You um, cannot have two different federal awards at the same time. Namely, we talked about the Fulbright program, but we can you can really only have one federal fellowship at the same time. Basically, what that means is you're we should not be uh, supporting, we wouldn't be giving you DDRA funds for something that a different federal grant was already covering um, because that would not be appropriate. Um, so we do need to know any other federal awards or grants that you would have concurrently so we can make sure that there's no duplication of funds. 
and uh, you cannot have defaulted on any federal student loans um, if you are going to receive a DDRI fellowship. And there is a note about that um, on the application that you'll see. So those are some of the basics of, you know, getting started, applying eligibility, uh, being a project director. I'm going to now pass it over to Pamela, and she's going to talk more about what you can receive or what can be covered with a DDRA fellowship when it comes to um, finances and traveling overseas. And she'll also talk more about the criteria and how applications will be scored. So thank you all and passing it over to you, Pamela. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate that. And let's talk about what the DDRA grant covers. The DDRA grant may be used for your international economy travel to and from your research location, health and accident insurance for the student while abroad, your books, your project expenses that are allowable, technology related to your uh, project expenses, travel within the host countries, your affiliation fees at your institutions, and your dependents. And we define dependents as your married spouse and your the unmarried children under 21. Okay, um, and in our uh, application handbook is what we call our maintenance allowance list. And this is a list of all of the countries um, and also what amount uh, that you will receive as part of your maintenance or your living expenses. Um, and for these competitions, you have to be careful um, that uh, of the countries in the list in the maintenance allowances are the allowable and closed countries uh, that any country that is closed, you would not be eligible to travel to. For example, Russia, China, Cuba, and Hong Kong are not eligible locations and we will not fund any research to these areas. So check that um, list in our application handbook instructions for which countries are allowable and um, are not eligible. Dependents do not include common law spouses or domestic partnerships or anything other than legally married couples that are legally recognized by a state. Children must have a birth certificate. And uh, we also do not cover dependent allowances for fiancés. We must have a marriage certificate at the time of application to be eligible for a dependent allowance. DDRA fellowship is different from other fellowships in what they can provide funding, they do not provide funds for any research or project activities conducted in the U.S. No DDRA funds can be used in the U.S. This is part of the law for the program. We do not give any funds for gifts, stipends, salary, monetary honoraria, food, any other uh, remuneration for research subjects, or research assistance, anyone other than the fellow. Reimbursement for travel that is not approved for the from the U.S. Department of Education. For example, if you leave before your grant activation request, do not be reimbursed for any travel. Any allowances for dependents not accompanying the fellow for the entire research period. The program's designed for you have a family for the whole family to travel with the fellow at the same time. We cannot uh, have any travel for dependents who are not traveling with the fellow. Okay, that's a very hard and fast rule of the program. We don't cover travel for dependents. Um, there is a dependents allowance in the program. We don't pay for motorized vehicles. 
not cars or mopeds or motorcycles. Those are liability issues. Travel and expenses not directly related to your project. All expenditures due to changes in the itinerary or the grant agreement. If you decide that you want to do some research in another area that wasn't included in your original grant, those would have to be, you would have to use that research after your DDRA experience, and then you are required to pay for that on yourself. We also cannot fund any type of pre-award costs, your passports visas, photos, or identifying documents for clearance, that's a federal rule. So we cannot pay for any pre-award uh, document expenses or pre-award travel to obtain a visa or research permission. You would have to fund that on your own because that is a federal rule, okay? Any physical examinations, immunizations, or other medical expenses, prior to the DDRA um, in-country travel, that is something you are responsible for because that is a U.S. cost. Any tuition or fees at your university currently that is not uh, something that DDRA covers, and any obligations not occurred within the grant period. We do get some of these things in your budgets, and if you put any of these items into your budget, they will be removed, and you will not receive funding for these unallowable costs. Okay, so we talked about the roles and responsibilities. We talked about what's included in your budget. Now let's talk about the actual selection criteria that you will be assessed upon. And what we have are what we call peer reviewers to assess your applications. And they are world area specialists in foreign languages and area studies from institutions of higher education, government agencies, NGOs, former, um, former fellows, as well as uh, as experts and specialists in the world area or language. Peer reviewers determine the technical score in accordance with our competitive preference priorities, the quality of the proposed projects, and the qualification of the applicant. These are the main areas of the DDRA application. And it's broken up into these three areas and the points. So the quality of the proposed project is a different configuration this year, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But the quality of proposed project is worth 63 points, and the qualification of the applicant is maximum 37 points. So the selection criteria total is 100 points, okay? That's mainly what your application will be assessed around. But we also have opportunities for particular areas in which the department is interested in our competitive preference priorities. Um, and those are worth two points each. And Amy talked about those a little earlier and I'll go into some details on those, but they are essentially language, that you're in one of the qualified languages is worth two points. The academic field is worth two points, as well as um, whether or not the institution is a minority serving institution, a historically black college or university or Hispanic serving institution. And we will assess the institution one here at the department. Um, so, and those are worth six points. So there is a maximum of 106 points available for DDRA. And so as you can see, there have been big changes as a result of um, some changes in our regulations. We now have a new criteria and I'll talk more about that, but I wanted you to briefly see the breakdown and I'll go through each of these to give you some tips on what it is we're looking for, okay? 
So as you can see, the qualifications of applicants, we have the language proficiency is now worth 10 points and the applicant overcoming language barriers, our new criterion is worth five points. And you can see dissemination plan is worth three points and uh, the ability to conduct research overseas is now worth two points. Okay, so that's a big change from prior years and uh, as a result of new legislation and changes in our selection criteria. So let's start off by looking at the quality of the proposed project. Okay, the quality of proposed project, as I said, is now worth 63 points. So it is uh, two thirds of the points mostly. And um, the main difference is the points in the hypothesis statement and the dissemination plan have both changed. And this, this time, we want to increase the points for the hypothesis statement and research question, because this is really the core of your research project. And here we would want to see the proposal is well organized, it's excellently conceived, and here we would like to see that the proposal is well organized and excellently conceived, the research questions are clear. Here you want to discuss the sampling method used and the selection criteria for choosing the people and the documentation to be interviewed and studied. What type of research method is being used? Is it an ethnographic? Is it some other form of research method? You need to describe that and that your justification of why you're using those research methods. And that should be strongly and supported. And you would also, the readers are also looking for a timeline for your research. And these are the things I've covered are things that we frequently see our peer reviewers really highlighting as some of the best applications. So you want to take advantage of this information. Next is the literature review, and it's worth 10 points. Here we're looking for you to demonstrate your knowledge of the relevant literature in the field that you have analyzed and articulated the potential impact of the research and that your research is demonstrates some form of originality of the research to the field. Next is, what is the preliminary research you've already conducted? And that's worth 10 points. And here we want to see that you have indicated that you've completed substantial preliminary research and you have a demonstrated a clear plan for how you will conduct the research in country. Your justification for overseas research. And here the, uh, the readers are looking for a clear justification as to why this research needs to be conducted overseas. Um, and it can't be done here in the US. And the applicant needs to demonstrate your appropriate connections that you have made in the host country. This is where you talk about your affiliations, have letters of support from your host country, affiliations, institutions, um, non-government agencies. Uh, here, this is where you would want to have that information. Your dissemination plan is now worth three points. And the applicant should demonstrate a clear plan of how you're going to share your preliminary and, fi and final findings of your research with invested stakeholders and the academic community. And be clear about how you will share a copy of your dissertation with the host country or institution, the NGO and community organizations who will have collaborated with you 
on the research. Next up is the guidance and supervision from your advisor and committee. And sometimes people do not uh, pay attention to this category, but it's worth a tenth of the application. So here you want to indicate whether you have a strong plan of how the advisor and committee will guide and supervise the work of the applicant. Are you going to meet on Zoom? Are you going to talk on the phone? Um, are you going to email? All of these things you need to have indicated how you're going to stay connected with your advisor while you're abroad and how the advisor will uh, continuously meet with you. And this is because we don't want students kind of out in the field uh, left alone without kind of that connection back with their institution. You also want to provide information on how the advisor and committee is engaged and invested in the applicant, as well as the people selected for the committee, um, their role in your application. Next up is the qualifications of the applicant. And here, this is about you. So we want you to talk about your academic record, your strength and your area studies, and then about your language ability and our new category of overcoming language barriers. So, and the, what's your ability to conduct research overseas? The, New point structure for the qualification of the applicants is a maximum of 37 points. Okay. And the first is the your academic record. Do you have a strong evidence of an academic record, strong GPA? Have you been the recipient of previous fellowships, grants, scholarships? Have you presented papers? or attended conferences in your area related to your discipline or your current research? Are you a teaching assistant in the discipline related to the research? These are the kind of things you would wanna highlight to discuss your academic record. And it's worth 10 points. As well, the applicant strength in your area studies. This is your discipline in area studies. And so they're going to look at your academic record in terms of the courses that you took related to area studies um, in your transcripts or your related to your proposed project. And so it might be helpful to add the courses in your CV under courses relevant to the proposed project. Um, and so the the reviewers can quickly see what courses are related to your topic. So this is something, it's worth 10 points, but you need to pay attention to make it so that you are describing the courses and how well you've done in your courses in area studies. Remember, that's a, a key component of the DDRA program is that area studies, and the next question, which is language proficiency. Remember, DDRA and our, all of our ISD programs seek to help U.S. citizens improve their language efficiencies in languages other than English. So here, we will look at the applicant's language evaluations and that they have a high level of competency in a non-English language of the country or countries of research. So your language should be related to the country that you're going to or the archival language being used. Even if the official language of the country is English, you must use a non-English world language, global language in your research. The use of English only is prohibited and no points will be awarded. 
Okay. Um, and this has been changed so that if you are a native speaker of a language, you are now eligible to receive points for your language ability. And we will assess this using the language evaluation and information provided in the application. Okay, and so this year we have a brand new category and it is how did you overcome your language barrier? And this is worth five points. And here we are looking to see what the applicant has done to increase their language proficiency relative to the project, okay? So applicants can need to discuss their, uh, how they have improved upon their language. And you can do this by highlighting in the application if you've taken additional language courses, you tutor in the language, you are a TA in the language. Um, did you use a language application such as Babbel or one of the ones on the market? Um, what we want to see is how you have overcome any kind of language deficiencies you might have to be able to function in your research in the country and using the language abroad. And the final one in this category is the applicant's ability to conduct research overseas. And this is now worth two points. So here we want to understand how the applicant is at, do they have the ability to perform your research abroad as proposed? And we'll look at your previous overseas experiences and also the references and um, their uh, review of if you are ready to conduct research abroad. And, and we're looking to see if your references gave you exemplary recommendations, okay? So um, that is the selection criteria. There are some changes. We will have a live Q&A session where you can bring all of your questions about the selection criteria and go on our website and sign in on the link. It is now worth 100 points uh, for the selection criteria for the program. In addition to our absolute priorities, which Amy discussed earlier, which are worth a maximum of six points, and as well, our all applicants, as Amy described, must be in one of the seven geographic regions. If you are not in one of the seven geographic regions, or you are proposing research in the U.S. or one of its territories, you would not be eligible for um, the DDR rate application. And even though we get this, Puerto Rico is a part of the U.S. and its territories. So um, cannot propose research in a, for example, in Puerto Rico. Next, we have our technical uh, review. Here are our selection criteria. Um, just so you understand that we are looking for uh, projects that focus on modern foreign languages, except French, German, or Spanish, and also here, modern foreign languages. So languages that are antiquated, such as Latin, Sanskrit, hieroglyphics are not modern languages and are not eligible for points, okay? This is assessed whether or not a person is using a language other than the ones listed. It's not an assessment of their um, language evaluation or ability in that language, okay? That's the kind of particular priority category. There. Okay. 
And Amy described earlier the competitive preference. Here are the um, research areas, disciplines that we particularly are interested in, which cover the STEM fields, computer science, education, international development, political science, public health, and economics. And our third is again on our minority serving HBCU tribal colleges. And Ed, we will calculate this automatically for the uh, applications. So you don't have to do anything to qualify for this. Ed will assess this priority. Okay, let's talk about then some application tips that may be helpful for you that we've seen from successful applicants. In writing your proposal, you want to address all the selection criteria in the order listed in the application packet. Um, and this means if you do a, a outline of each of the selection criteria and respond to them in that order, that makes it very easy for the reviewers to be able to find your information. Remember, the easier it is for the reviewers to be able to find and um, be able to review your information, the easier it is for them to give you a better score. Don't make them hunt and peck trying to find your stuff because you're not organized, okay? Provide a detailed research plan. Remember your um, hypothesis and research uh, question selection criteria is now worth 20% of this score. So it's very important that you have a, a solid, organized and detailed research plan. And provide sufficient details about your research goals uh, so that you are communicating to the reviewers that you understand what it is you're doing. One important thing is to prep your references and give them plenty of time to give you a glowing recommendation. Sometimes we see recommendations that are not glowing. So make sure you are choosing someone who is going to give you a really good recommendation. Um, as well as one thing to remind your uh, references is if you submit your application to your institution, but your references have not uh, finished their uh, re reference, they have not submitted their reference, the reviewer, the um, reference will be locked out. So, and they will not be able to submit. So give your references a deadline as to when they need to submit their references so that when you go to submit, all of the references should say complete. Um, and if someone has not submitted, um, we will not accept anything outside of the G5 system, and you will may miss the opportunity for someone to submit a reference for you. So make sure that you give deadlines to your references. Avoid a lot of grammatical errors or very specific professional bar of jargon or acronyms. These are being, your applications are reviewed by world area and language specialists, but they may not be a particular specialist in your particular dissertation topic. So make sure that you're writing in such a way that your friends, or people outside your field will be able to understand your proposal. And so we, we say that if anybody can understand your research, you've given a really good description of what you're doing. So make sure that um, you are writing in such a way that is accessible, but gives a clear understanding of your topic. Remember, the whole entire application counts not just your project narrative. So make sure that you are, once again, that you answer all of the selection criteria. Okay, 
um, some things not to do, please don't wing it. Be clear in what you propose to do. You also, please do not wait until the deadline to contact people to have them submit information and because you need letters of support and you also want to give your institution enough time to complete their portion of the official forms. So I would not recommend that you, the last minute, start this process. Please give yourself time for everyone involved to help you submit your application. As well, do not propose doing research in a country to which you will need to speak another language and you have no evidence of having learned that language. Okay, so you need to have a level of language proficiency for every country that you are planning to conduct research in. If you are reapplying, do not ignore the suggestions that were given from the technical review form that you received in your prior application. That's a very helpful tool to help you with some maybe deficiencies or some missed opportunities in your application. And as well, make sure you're not just resubmitting the same application. The selection criteria have changed and the points have changed. So you want to make sure that you are, if you're reapplying, that you're following the newest guidance for the program. Okay, um, and submitting your application, you want to make sure you're registered in G5 early to avoid any systems issues. I would suggest backing up or saving your documents to avoid any kind of computer issues and give your institution project director enough time to complete the application and remind them of the due date. And project directors, remind your fellows of the due date because you can have at your institution project directors a due date that all of your applicants need to submit the application at your institution. This can be different than the due date in order for you to review all the applications to get them submitted on time. If you're applying as a fellow, but your institution does not have a project director, some uh, locations on campus that are helpful, go to your sponsored programs office, your graduate studies office, or your fellowship office or international affairs office and see if someone in one of those offices would be willing to submit the application on behalf of the institution. Again, we can't emphasize enough to please remove all personally identifiable information from your documents, mostly your transcripts. Some of you have older transcripts, which included your social security number as your student ID, or it has your birth date in it as an institutional ID, or it has some other personally identifiable information. Use redacting software or simply take a marker and scratch out that information before you upload those PDFs into G5 because these applications do go abroad and um, we don't want any of that information to be revealed in the system. Again, please do not wait until the last minute to submit. The G5 system shuts down applications at 11.59 in 59 seconds p.m. And after that, there are no exceptions. We cannot um, uh, slip something in at the last minute or after the due date. So as well, submitting from an international location may not be possible as these are being submitted through a U.S. government server. And sometimes the system may not accept 
um, materials from non-US servers. So if all possible, try and upload any documents from a US server, even if you're abroad, or select your uh, references who are here in the US who can upload from US servers. We cannot intervene if you cannot upload documents from an international server as G5 is a US government platform and may not allow access from foreign servers. Right, so we're coming to the end and the application deadline is March 29th. 2024 at 11.59 59 seconds p.m. Washington, D.C. time. So calculate what that might be in terms of where you are in the U.S. or in the world submitting your application. Any questions, comments, uh, you can send to our email at ddra at ed.gov. And one of us, I'm Dr. Pamela Mamer, Amy Marion, and Carly White um, will be available to answer questions. Check out our program webpage that's shown there. And we will have live Q&A sessions February 20th at 3 o'clock to 4.15. Eastern time, Washington, D.C. time, we're live. You can come in and ask any question that you like. Um, the February 22nd at 3 o'clock to 4.15, it's time for fellowship applicants to ask questions. If they have any particular questions, um, that's the time for the applicants to ask questions. And I'll also walk through the G5 um, portal for how you submit applications for fellows, as well as on March 7th at four o'clock uh, Eastern time, Washington DC time, is a time for project directors to come in with any questions that they may have about their forms or documents or any questions. Um, and I'm gonna walk through how project directors submit the entire application into the G5 portal at that time. You have questions about technical matters. Um, you know, I can't upload a form in G5. G5 is not letting me in. Um, I'm having issues with my uh, registration. Those are G5 technical questions. And here's the number uh, that you can contact G5. And uh, if you have um, more questions about G5, if they have a training manual, and you can access that here. And that is our session for today. We appreciate your coming and staying and paying attention. Uh, I'm Dr. Pamela Mamer, along with Amy Marion. And we look forward to receiving your applications. Any questions, send them to ddra at ed.gov. Appreciate you joining us today. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Good luck.